everyone, I'm Whitney Whitaker. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play this one. The first one is Asthma. So I'm going to go ahead and start this video for y'all. Children had asthma in 2015. The agency also reports that in 2013, 13.8 million school days were missed due to the disease, making it a leading cause of school absenteeism. Asthma is a long-term inflammatory disease that causes the airways of the lungs to tighten and constrict, leading to wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and coughing. The inflammation also causes the airways of the lungs to become especially sensitive to a variety of asthma triggers. The particular trigger or triggers and the severity of the symptoms can differ for each person with asthma. This sometimes life-threatening respiratory disease can be controlled through proper medical treatment and by managing exposure to environmental triggers that can cause an asthma attack. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency lists the following asthma triggers commonly found in or around school buildings. They include respiratory viruses, cockroaches and other pests, mold resulting from excess moisture in the school, Dander from animals in the classroom. Dander brought in on clothing from animals at home. Secondhand smoke. Dust mites. Cleaning agents, perfumes, pesticides, and other sprays. Ozone. Particle pollution. And bus exhaust. Fortunately, there are environmental tests and air monitoring instruments to identify these and other known asthma triggers, along with common respiratory irritants, and allergens. If detected, corrective actions can be taken to mitigate or eliminate exposure concerns. These are just a few things to know about managing asthma and identifying asthma triggers in the school environment. To learn more about this or other building science, indoor air quality, industrial hygiene, environmental health, or safety issues, please visit the website shown on the screen. Okay, so asthma is probably one of the biggest things that we deal with in our school district. So children um, will need a prescription and a doctor's order to keep their inhalers with them in their backpacks, in their purses. If not, it has to be stored with your campus nurse. And um, if you think a child is showing signs or symptoms of having an asthma attack, um, call your nurse and let them know and we can bring their inhaler to the classroom instead of them trying to come to us. Uh, if it's not serious enough, they can go ahead and walk down and use their inhaler, but if it's severe, we will come to them. And then um, a lot of them will use their inhalers before PE and just go into recess. If y'all have any questions or concerns, you're more than welcome to ask us any. Um, but that's pretty much it on asthma. The next thing I'm going to hit on is um, diabetes, the hyper and the hypo of something. All school staff need some basic knowledge about diabetes. Diabetes is a chronic disease that affects adults and children. It cannot be cured, but it can be managed. Diabetes management is 24-7. You have to time and balance your meals, exercise, insulin, or other diabetes medications, and monitor blood glucose levels. Generally, food, stress, illness, or injury can cause blood glucose levels to go up. Insulin and other diabetes medications and physical activity make blood glucose levels go down. Glucose, also known as sugar, gives us energy. Glucose comes from food, especially carbohydrates. It's carried from the blood into cells in the body by a hormone called insulin. 
People with type 1 diabetes don't make insulin, while people with type 2 diabetes don't make enough insulin, and or the insulin does not work properly. With type 1 diabetes, which used to be called juvenile diabetes, the immune system is involved. For some reason, the body destroys cells in the pancreas that make insulin. This type of diabetes is called type 1 diabetes, and it is when there is no insulin being produced by the pancreas. It's the most common type in children and adolescents. The treatment for type 1 diabetes is maintaining blood glucose levels with a balance of food, physical activity, and insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin, or the insulin being produced isn't helping glucose enter the cells. Type 2 used to be referred to as adult onset diabetes, but is increasingly being seen in younger people. Inactivity and being overweight are risk factors for type 2 diabetes, so exercise and good nutrition are important to prevent and treat type 2 diabetes in youth. Sometimes oral medications, insulin, or other injectable medications are also required. But whether it's type 1 or type 2 diabetes, the problem is the same. The body's own insulin isn't doing what it needs to do to move glucose from the blood to the cells where it can be used as energy. Not enough insulin means there's too much glucose in the blood because it isn't getting from the blood into the cells in the body. This is known as hyperglycemia or high blood glucose. Too much insulin can cause the opposite problem hypoglycemia, or low blood glucose. Diabetes management is all about keeping blood glucose levels in a safe range. Not too high, but not too low either. This means having access to the necessary tools, like a blood glucose meter, insulin, food, glucagon, and sometimes other diabetes medications, and the school nurse and school diabetes team, which can include teachers, the principal, school secretary, cafeteria workers, and others, in order to maintain a proper balance. For the student's diabetes needs, a plan should be documented in the student's diabetes medical management plan, which includes physician's orders for the student in the school setting and other written care plans and distributed to the school diabetes team. Diabetes can be serious in the short term if blood glucose levels become too low, over the long term, high blood glucose levels can lead to complications like heart disease, stroke, blindness, amputation, and kidney failure. This is why good care is important. While diabetes is serious and does require 24-7 care, there's no need to be frightened or intimidated. The needs of the student can be safely and easily met when the school diabetes team has been properly trained and works together. I'm going to, oh, I turned it off. I'm going to now show you all the differences between hyper and hypoglycemia, some signs and symptoms to kind of look for with both of them. danger to students with diabetes is hypoglycemia. That's low blood glucose. Remember how it sounds. Hypo, low. The other thing you need to remember is that many times hypoglycemia cannot always be prevented. Be alert for a range of possible signs that something's wrong. Different students can have different symptoms. They may be lethargic or irritable. They may feel weak or unable to think straight. They may be combative, and they may start sweating. Hypoglycemia can come on suddenly without warning. Students can get tired or start feeling ill for any number of reasons. Test your blood sugar. Are you sure? If they're doing sports, they can sweat. But if they've got diabetes, you need to watch for any change in behavior or appearance. Hypoglycemia can be unpredictable. The student's condition can deteriorate very quickly. 
If not treated promptly, they may have a seizure, trouble swallowing, or they may faint. Be familiar with the student's low symptoms and treatment as contained in the diabetes medical management plan, and know where to find the student's low blood glucose supplies. Fruit juice, glucose tabs, or regular soda can deliver 15 grams of fast-acting carbohydrate. Your job is to intervene and treat before the student's condition worsens. And remember, a student experiencing hypoglycemia should never be left alone. Hypoglycemia can come on at any time, not just during sports. Sometimes the signs are not going to jump out at you. But again, if you've got a student with diabetes, keep an eye out for the red flags. Watch to see if she's sweating or feeling weak when she shouldn't be, if she loses interest or looks pale or sleepy. Clammy skin can be another sign, but the main thing to look for is the change in behavior. A minute ago, the student was focused and looked fine. Very suddenly though, she's lost interest and she looks just out of it. You have your meter in your purse? It's in my locker, but I'll be okay. Stay right there, I'm gonna get you some juice. Hypoglycemia can sometimes affect the way people think. So don't expect the student to know what's happening or even be cooperative. If you don't have a blood glucose meter, Treat for hypoglycemia anyway. After a hypoglycemic event, kids need time to rest and recover. Here's hyperglycemia, signs and symptoms now and what to look for. Because people with diabetes don't have enough insulin, their bodies can't move glucose from the blood into the other cells. The glucose builds up in the bloodstream. High blood glucose above target range is called hyperglycemia. To help you remember, think hyper, think high. Any number of things can cause hyperglycemia. It's possible that the student has forgotten to take insulin or hasn't taken enough. The student may have eaten more than planned. Food raises blood glucose levels. Stress, inactivity, or illness can also cause hyperglycemia. Among the signs are thirst, tiredness, dry skin, and stomach pains. Also fatigue, the inability to concentrate, and frequent urination are signs of hyperglycemia. Whatever the cause, you need to know how to recognize hyperglycemia. This is important. While hyperglycemia should be avoided and treated in all students according to the Diabetes Medical Management Plan, which may include giving insulin, it is important to know that the onset of hyperglycemia comes on more quickly in students who experience insulin pump malfunctions. You're not expected to be a doctor, but when you have a student with diabetes and you notice that something's wrong, you've got to take action. Now, with diabetes, we don't generally have just a whole range of students that are affected by this, but when we do, I usually get with the teacher or the campus nurse will get with the teacher and just kind of, with that student, go through that student checking the blood sugar and what their um, diabetes care plan looks like. And as the year goes on, then you get to know that student and you will let us know how we are best to assist you and that student in a setting where they are too high or too low. And it's generally, we follow the doctor's care plan on those specific ranges for that specific child. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next video now. Dr. 
Dr. Ruchi Gupta, and today I'll be talking about anaphylaxis and how to respond if it happens in your school. When it comes to managing severe allergies and anaphylaxis, it's critical that you have the tools to know it, see it, and treat it. First, it's important to know the basics about anaphylaxis, what it is, and who's at risk. Anaphylaxis is a medical term describing a serious, life-threatening allergic reaction that can happen within minutes, often without warning. It happens when the immune system mistakenly overreacts to what we call an allergic trigger. Common allergic triggers include food, stinging or biting insects, latex, medicines, or exercise. Avoiding known allergic triggers is the first step to preventing anaphylaxis from happening. But accidents happen, and sometimes people can develop severe allergies to something they've been in contact with before with no problems. That brings us to our second step. You've got to be able to recognize anaphylaxis when it occurs. Signs and symptoms can vary from person to person, and students may describe what they're experiencing differently than an adult would. Common parts of the body affected by anaphylaxis include the skin. Visible symptoms like rashes and eyes are common, but aren't always present. Listen for verbal cues like, my skin feels prickly, or my arm feels strange. The airways. Listen carefully for any coughing or wheezing. A child might say something like, my chest hurts, or it's hard to breathe. Digestive system. The person may complain about an upset stomach or nausea or may begin to vomit. Cardiovascular system. Chest pain, a weak pulse, and fainting can all be signs of a cardiovascular problem. Central nervous system. Dizziness, headaches, and confusion. For a child you suspect is experiencing anaphylaxis, this could be something as simple as, I feel funny. Although there is no absolute rule, doctors generally identify anaphylaxis by one of the following. If the person has respiratory or cardiovascular symptoms, such as experiencing trouble breathing or chest pains, or if the person has symptoms involving two or more body systems, such as a skin rash coupled with nausea, or perhaps they develop hives and dizziness. When tragedies from life-threatening allergies occur, it's often because people have trouble recognizing anaphylaxis from a less severe allergic reaction. That's why it's critical to know the symptoms and the third step, how to treat anaphylaxis as it happens. A person experiencing anaphylaxis should be treated right away with an epinephrine auto-injector, such as an EpiPen auto-injector, and seek immediate emergency medical care after use. EpiPen Epinephrine Injection USP 0.3 mg and EpiPen Junior Epinephrine Injection USP 0.15 mg auto injectors for the emergency treatment of life threatening allergic reactions, anaphylaxis caused by allergens, exercise, or unknown triggers, and for people who are at increased risk for these reactions. EpiPen and EpiPen Junior are intended for immediate administration as emergency supportive therapy only. Seek immediate emergency medical help right away. Seeking immediate emergency medical care is important because healthcare professionals must continue to monitor and evaluate the allergic reaction. In some cases, reactions can look like they've resolved or gone away, but the person can begin experiencing symptoms again. National Food Allergy Guidelines recommend that those at risk for anaphylaxis have access to two epinephrine auto-injectors at all times. Having this access is important because up to 20% of people experiencing anaphylaxis require more than one dose of epinephrine before symptoms subside. If more than two sequential doses of epinephrine are needed, it should only be given under direct medical supervision. Please know that antihistamines or corticosteroids do not treat life-threatening symptoms of anaphylaxis. Epinephrine is the first-line treatment for a life-threatening allergic reaction. Use EpiPen or EpiPen Jr. auto-injectors right away when you have an allergic emergency, anaphylaxis. Get emergency medical help right away. You may need further medical attention. 
Only a healthcare professional should give additional doses of epinephrine if you need more than two injections for a single anaphylactic episode. EpiPen or EpiPen Jr. should only be injected into the middle of your outer thigh, upper leg, through clothing if necessary. Do not inject into your veins, buttocks, fingers, toes, hands, or feet. Hold the leg of young children firmly in place before and during injection to prevent injuries. In case of accidental injection, please seek immediate medical treatment. Rarely, patients who have used EpiPen or EpiPen Jr. may develop an infection at the injection site within a few days. Some of these infections can be serious. Call your healthcare professional right away if you have any of the following at an injection site. Redness that does not go away, swelling, tenderness, or the area feels warm to the touch. Tell your healthcare professional about all of your medical conditions, especially if you have asthma, a history of depression, thyroid problems, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, high blood pressure or heart problems, have any other medical conditions, are pregnant or plan to become pregnant, or are breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed. Be sure to also tell your healthcare professional all the medicines you take, especially medicines for asthma. If you have certain medical conditions or take certain medicines, your condition may get worse or you may have longer lasting side effects when you use EpiPen or EpiPen Jr. Common side effects include fast, irregular, or pounding heartbeat, sweating, nausea or vomiting, breathing problems, paleness, dizziness, weakness, shakiness, headache, feelings of overexcitement, nervousness, or anxiety. These side effects usually go away quickly if you lie down and rest. Tell your healthcare professional if you have any side effect that bothers you or that does not go away. With an estimated 1 in 13 kids in the U.S. living with a food allergy and kids spending so much of their time in school, it's more important than ever to be ready if anaphylaxis occurs. Alright, so that is for anyone who has a severe allergy and when you go into Skyward, we will generally, once we know after registration that this child has asthma, diabetes, seizures, whatever the student may have, we will put an alert in Skyward. And if it's an allergy, we will let you know what the alert and what the allergy is so that y'all are aware of it as well. Again, we would need a doctor's note for the children to keep their EpiPens on them in their backpacks. Otherwise, it will be stored in the nurse's office. And in the case of an emergency that your child is having an allergic reaction, we will bring the EpiPen with us to the classroom and then call 911. Another thing, which I don't have a video for, is seizures. Um, so we do have sometimes quite a few kids, depending on the year, who have seizures. In the event that a child is having a seizure, and some of them, there are no pre-warning signs that they're going to have a seizure if they're just down and out. Um, other times, you will learn the student and you'll know, okay, well, they're staring off in space or they're acting a little different, so let's check on them. Uh, if they do start having a seizure, please lay them on their side. Don't restrict them. Keep them safe. Get the kids out of the room. Um, so that they're not crowding their own student. You just want the student to be as safe as possible. Nothing in their mouth, near their mouth, nothing like that. And then you'll call the campus nurse and we will come and time it. I, whenever they start having a seizure, a big thing is time it. Time it, time it, time it. Because from the time it may take some of us to get from the nurse's office to y'all, uh, generally, the care plan will state five minutes, and we will, if they're still having a seizure after five minutes, we'll have to call the ambulance to come in and take the student, and as well give them the um, emergency medication. So, if they do have a seizure, just place them on their side, make sure to call the nurses and time it. But other than that, that's it. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them, um, and I look forward to the school year with all of you. Thank <laughs> you.